So now we come to chapter eight and a full-on discussion of chemical bonding. Up to this point in the previous chapters, we've talked primarily about atoms and the atomic structure, but now we need to look at what happens when we bring those atoms together to form molecules. What does that look like when we form chemical bonds? To begin this discussion, we need to note first that because only valence electrons are involved in chemical reactions, chemical bonds are formed only involving the valence electrons of the constituent atoms. So how do we picture this? What's a good description of a chemical bond? We'll get to, that, to some of that in a moment, but the one tool that we use to help us picture this is Lewis structures, also known as Lewis symbols, when we're talking specifically about atoms. And a Lewis structure or Lewis symbol is a depiction of the valence electrons around the atomic symbol. So it simply looks something like this. If you take nitrogen and you arrange the valence electrons around the four faces of the atomic symbol, and there is a particular method to the way that we do this. But we generate something along these lines where nitrogen has five valence electrons, and so we see five, elect we see five dots around nitrogen. So how do we go about actually writing these? Well, the first step is just to write the atomic symbol and to list the total number of valence electrons, which we'll sometimes refer to as just VE. So we write N and we list or note that we have five valence electrons. Then we place the valence electrons around the four faces of the symbol. We do it one at a time until all of the elements have been, all of the electrons, sorry, have been used up. So we start, it doesn't matter what face we start at, but we start there and we just go around the symbol and it doesn't matter if we go clockwise or counterclockwise. We fill those in on each of the faces before we pair up any of the valence electrons. After we've run out of the four faces, if we have extra, as we do in nitrogen, we've got one extra. Uh, we have five, so you're going to have to pair one up. Now, here's a few examples of Lewis symbols. So if we take carbon or fluorine or boron, carbon has four valence electrons, so you see we simply place a dot on each of the four faces. Fluorine, on the other hand, has seven. So let's say that we started at the top uh, and worked our way clockwise. We would put one, two, three, four, and then we would need to pair up. Now that we have three extras, so we would pair on the top, pair on the side, and pair on the bottom, and that leaves us only one unpaired electron shown here. Boron only has three valence electrons, so again, it doesn't matter how we did this. We could have started at the right and worked our way counterclockwise. We could have started at the left and worked our way clockwise. Um, I suppose you could have started at the top and then kind of gone in a disjointed manner. My recommendation for writing these is to pick one method and stick consistently to it. If you want to start at the top and always work clockwise, that's fine. It's entirely up to you, but I would recommend staying consistent in your method. Now, one thing you may note is that the max number of valence electrons in this method is eight. And if you look back at the periodic table and our discussions from chapters six and seven, You'll note that for any element other than the transition metals, if you're not in the D block or technically in the F block, we haven't really talked about whether we count F electrons as valence electrons at all, but if we're not in the D block, then the maximum number of valence electrons is eight. Uh, the, um, if we consider, if we look at the noble gases, for example, we would consider those to have eight valence electrons because even if they have a D, even if they have D electrons, those are that that orbital set is filled and it's at a lower energy level, so it's not counted as valence electrons. So although there are cases if we talk about transition metals where perhaps a different rule might apply, uh, the 
number eight here will become important for everything that we uh, are concerned with for this class. Now there's another term that is useful when talking about chemical bonding and using these Lewis symbols, because remember, we're, we're only writing these as a way to help us visualize chemical bonding. And this new term is known as the valence. Now, this is distinct from number of valence electrons. The valence is something different entirely. The valence is the number of unpaired electrons in an atomic Lewis structure. So if we look at nitrogen, for example, it has three unpaired electrons, and we refer to it as having a valence of three, even though it has five valence electrons. The valence and the valence electrons are two separate terms. Boron would have a valence of three here because we're looking at unpaired electrons, not at empty spaces. Boron does have a blank space on its uh, Lewis symbol because we only had three valence electrons but it only has a valence of three. Fluorine only has a valence of one, whereas carbon has the greatest valence here of four. Now, this also leads us to one more important term, and that's something known as the octet rule. This gets back to the uh, point that the max number of valence electrons is eight, and that's that atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons until they are surrounded by eight valence electrons. Remember how back in our discussions of ions back in the early chapters, how we said that uh, some elements will lose electrons, such as lithium would lose an electron, or perhaps a, a potassium would lose an electron to go back to having a noble gas configuration. Most of those noble gas configurations have eight valence electrons. So if uh, potassium, for example, were to lose its one valence electron, it would go back to having the uh, it would go back to having the noble gas configuration, which has eight valence electrons around it. Or fluorine, for example, gains one electron to become a fluoride ion and have eight, then it goes from seven to eight valence electrons around it. And that works for ions, but now we're encountering a new term known as uh, sharing electrons. We can also share electrons to accomplish the same purpose, and we'll go through that momentarily. So if atoms can gain, lose, or share electrons, then there are actually multiple forms of chemical bonding. And uh, one last note on the octet rule is that hydrogen, lithium, and beryllium are exceptions to this since they actually just prefer two valence electrons. Hydrogen can gain or share one uh, to get to two. Lithium and beryllium tend to lose electrons to just go back to two valence electrons, which would be the uh, configuration of helium. So if we have multiple types of bonding, let's take a quick look. There are actually two types of chemical bonding. There's ionic bonding, and then there's covalent bonding. There's actually a third known as metallic bonding, but we're not going to talk about that now. So what are the distinctions? Well, ionic bonding is a case where electrons are transferred completely from one element to another element that forms ions, and then those two ions are held together simply by the electrostatic attraction. So an example here would be reacting sodium and chlorine. And here we can see the usefulness of the Lewis structures, where we can see that the dot for sodium, sodium only has one valence electron, that dot represents its valence electron. We can simply draw an arrow showing that that dot or electron is transferred from sodium to the chlorine. And now we see the sodium has no valence electrons, but in reality, it has the electron configuration of the previous noble gas now, which has eight valence electrons. And chlorine now has gained an extra valence electron, so it has eight valence electrons. We have two ions. Sodium is positive because it's lost an electron. Chlorine is negative because it's gained one. And the two are simply held together by that electrostatic attraction. And that's ionic bonding. Uh, and it occurs only between metals and nonmetals. So metals and nonmetals. And that was the case for when we were talking about ionic compounds. Now, a couple other examples here that I can work out for you. 
So if we look at calcium oxide and the bonding that occurs in that, well, if we start out with calcium and draw its Lewis structure, it only has two valence electrons. My personal preference is to start at the right base and work clockwise. So I would draw a dot here and a dot here for calcium. Oxygen, on the other hand, has six valence electrons. So following my system, start here, one, two, three, four, and then I have two more I have to pair up. So five, six, that would get me the atomic Lewis structures. But then when we go to do bonding, I have a metal, calcium, with a non-metal. And so I'm going to uh, have an ionic bond occur. So I will take this electron and transfer it entirely over to here. Take this electron, transfer it entirely over to there. And what I am left with then is calcium, which is now two plus because it's lost both of its valence electrons. It has the electron configuration of the previous noble gas. And then oxygen, which now has eight valence electrons. All four sides are completely paired up and it has a two minus charge. And then the calcium and the oxygen are simply held together by the attraction between the two charges. Lithium and fluorine are very similar. Lithium, one valence electron. Fluorine, as we saw already, has seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Transferring from metal to non-metal produces the lithium cation and fluorine with now eight valence electrons and a negative one charge. And the lithium and fluorine are simply held together by electrostatic attraction. So that's ionic bonding. What are the other cases? Well, there's the other primary case is covalent bonding. And this is where the electrons are not transferred from one element to another element. Instead, they are shared between two elements and they're shared in pairs. So generally we would have two electrons that are shared between two elements. And this way each element gets to count that electron as being a valence electron of its own, even though it doesn't sit solely around that single element. So let's take a quick look here. If I look at hydrogen, H2, well, each hydrogen atom just has one valence electron. And if we did ionic bonding, well, that wouldn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Hydrogen's a non-metal. And how do we know which atom gets the, uh, gets the extra electron and which one um, loses the electron entirely? But instead, what happens is that they will place those two electrons around both atoms so that both nuclei may share those electrons and now hydrogen satisfied because it, uh, each hydrogen atom acts as though it has two valence electrons around it. Now it's the valence sites, it's those unpaired electrons that are used or paired to form bonds. So if we look at uh, taking two chlorine atoms to form diatomic uh, chlorine, we have only one valence site. Remember valence is the number of unpaired electrons. We have only one valence site per each chlorine atom. We have multiple cases, multiple faces of the Lewis symbols where electrons are paired up. Well, we don't share those. Instead, we share, the, we share at the valence sites. And so here, each chlorine starts out with seven valence electrons, but after sharing, then they each act as though they have eight and both are satisfied. Now a shared pair of electrons between two elements is known as a covalent bond. And rather than writing it as uh, two dots in between the two elements, we actually replace those two dots with a line, something like this. So 
uh, H2 or Cl2, the bond in between those two is represented simply with a line, and that line is understood as representing two electrons. So let's go through a few examples of this. If we start out with uh, nitrogen and with three fluorine atoms, so this is a slightly more complex example than the last two, remember that we simply pair up at open valence sites. And so nitrogen has three valence sites, fluorine has one. So if I simply bring each fluorine atom and pair it up at an open site, I can form this Lewis structure shown here, this molecular Lewis structure. But then remember that each shared pair of electrons that held between two atoms can be represented simply with a line. And so we get the more familiar looking structure here where we have lines in between the two atoms or in between the atoms. And the line is known to represent two electrons that are being shared by the atoms. And then there's many other examples. You can take the hydrogen, remember it has only one valence electron, fluorine, as we see up here has seven, it has one open site. You pair at the open sites and we form a bond. Or water, uh, oxygen has two open uh, sites, two valence sites, and you pair each of those with hydrogen to form water. And it's the same or similar concept for uh, ammonia or methane here. Now, unshared electrons that are in pairs, so the three pairs of electrons that are represented on fluorine, for example, or the two on oxygen or the one on nitrogen, those unshared pairs are referred to as lone pairs, simply because they are not shared between two atoms. They are simply located on one lone atom. And so if you hear me referring to uh, bonds or to lone pairs, this just gives you a, a better description of what's going 